In 2005, Walden Media and Walt Disney came up with this film, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. This was the inspiration behind the concepts that I'm going to be covering next to continue our topic on the non-technology aspects of high availability and disaster recovery. They have The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. I have The Lion, The Switch, and The Wardrobe. Key things to keep in mind as we continue to discuss the non-technology aspects. First, the lion or lions. This highlights the fact that you're not going to be alone. There will be people considered to be in charge. I mentioned in previous videos how an application or system or a platform is not isolated. It's going to be working in an ecosystem, which means your database server will have to interact with the network and, and a client and a middle tier and all the other things that form part of a bigger ecosystem. Each part of those is being taken care of by somebody and that somebody is considered a lion because he is or she is in charge of that specific component. You, the DBA, is responsible for taking care of the databases care and feeding the backups, how you configure the SQL Server instances, how you place the database files, you are that lion. You'll be responsible for taking care of the databases and for properly recovering the databases and the system if it goes down. In bigger organizations, there are separation of duties between the DBA and the server admin. In smaller organization, the server admin is also the DBA. But keep, keep in mind though, the server admin is in charge of provisioning the storage. Although in some cases, the storage engineer is responsible for that and then the server administrator is responsible for configuring the storage so that the operating system can see it. The server admin is also responsible for providing permissions on who can access the server. Also responsible for installing the patches, the service packs on the operating system. You got the network engineer who manages the network. Again, your database server has to be connected to a network. And the network engineer will be responsible for making sure that the traffic can go from the client to your SQL Server database that it's well working if something happens to the network they will be responsible for fixing it the supplier where you bought your hardware from well if you got a busted hard drive and you know it's hot swappable you can for example if, if you're on RAID 10 you can replace that broken drive and and plug in a new one but the question is what if you don't have an extra hard drive available as a spare you have to call your supplier and ask them how soon can you get me that spare again going back to the service level agreement make sure that you know what you what you were promised the manager the CIO or the CTO who needs to make the tough calls you might be responsible for the database Server admin might be responsible for the server. The network guy might be responsible for the network. But if the going gets tough, somebody has to make the tough calls. One exercise that we did uh, in my previous job, we had to be on standby for a major SAN upgrade. The SAN vendor promised that it's only going to take like four hours. So we were there on standby and the SAN engineers and the vendors started moving the data on to the new SAN and started configuring everything until after four hours nothing was working. Since nothing was working the best approach is to fix everything of course that's what us technical people usually do is fix everything and get everything up and running and solve the problem. But the thing is, the longer the system is down, again, going back to the business impact analysis, the longer that the system or the users will be able to access that system. And nobody's willing to make the call of, 
let's just roll everything back, switch everything back to the old sand, and see if that works. Somebody had to step in. The CIO had to step in and make that decision saying, forget about the sand upgrade today, roll everything back, let's continue next week. Because again, a natural, uh, our natural tendency as technology professionals is to solve that problem right there and then. The manager or the CIO or the CTO understands the criticality and they need to be there to make the right calls. The service provider who manages the dependent services. I mentioned this as part of uh, the SLA's discussion that we had. If you have an internet service provider, what was promised to you? And if you know that you can call them, you want to know if you're going to be redirected to a call center or you're going to be redirected to a, a level three engineer who can solve your problem. Know who that main contact person is for your service provider. Understand that it's not going to be you, just you, because there are different components in your system. Each of those components will be managed by somebody else. Make sure that you know who needs to be included in your pack. With the different disasters happening for the past couple of years, it's no longer even dependent on what we can see. It's dependent on the things that we don't see. An example being is Hurricane Sandy that hit back in 2012. Nobody ever realized that the guy driving the truck to provide the fuel for the generator systems is part of the pack. Because in order for those generator systems to keep on running, they need fuel. Nobody ever thought about the driver. Understand that there will be people who need to be in that pack and you need to define that early on in the process. The switch answers the question, what other hardware? And again, as technology professionals, we usually think of hardware as anything that relates to the server, the storage, the network. And as I mentioned earlier on, these are the things that we don't even think about. For example, that air conditioning system that you have in your data center. Is the temperature too hot in the data center? I mean, your servers in the data center have to be properly ventilated, keep the temperature down so that they perform well. In my previous job, we had to fix a performance issue that kept recurring. It was one time that the CPU went so high up that we can't really figure out what's causing the problem. The monitoring uh, tools we have for the data center are simply for the jobs failing, CPU, memory, storage, anything that has something to do with the server and the applications overall. So we're not seeing anything apart from the CPU spiking up until one guy who's working in the data center called us up and said one of the air conditioning system was busted and he saw the temperature in a data center go up. That's when we realized that the high CPU spikes in the production systems were caused by increase in the temperature inside a data center. What we ended up doing was shutting down all of the non-critical servers, the UAT systems, the staging servers. We just need to make sure that the data center doesn't get too hot for the production servers to shut down because of the temperature increase. As technology professionals, we don't really care about that, but it affects our high availability and disaster recovery solutions. Because you may have clustering in the data center, but if it's too hot, they may start shutting down because of increase in temperature. What about power supply? Is there enough power supply? Again, not something we usually think about because we do buy servers from our vendors and we buy hardware from our vendors. 
those components require power supplies. Understand that the more components we plug into our power source, the more electricity and power requirements is, uh, are needed. But we ha have we even thought about that? Proper planning and provisioning of enough power supply to power more components as we plug them into the data center. Classic example, three node clustering or two node clustering. If you add another server with the same specs and the same configuration, you're adding one more hardware that will draw in more power and electricity from your, your power source. If you hadn't planned for that, your electricity consumption may eventually overload your wires and your power source taking your entire data center down. Next, we have the wardrobe. The wardrobe represents other storage. And again, as technology professionals, we think about storage, we think about digital media, we think about the hard drives, but there's more to it than those storage that we know. Runbook and documentation. Yeah, we don't like writing do uh, documentation. It's a necessary evil. In fact, if you ask any IT professional out there who enjoy writing documentation, there'll be a very low percentage. But documentation in Runbook is key because you want documentation to be ready just in case something happens so that if you're on vacation, you have maybe a junior staff take that documentation and maybe rebuild the server based on the documentation you've written. Question is, do you even have one? Like I said, it's a necessary evil. Is it updated every time you do some change or make some change on your system, whether it's installing a service pack or a hotfix or making configuration changes? Change management is there for a reason. And a lot of organizations have implemented change management management systems really, really well. Unfortunately, change management systems stop there. They don't make sure that the documentation written for a specific system gets updated as a result of a change being implemented. Is it written properly? I usually treat documentation by making sure that the most senior guy writes the documentation and tested by the most junior guy. You're not gonna be there 24 by seven. I don't, don't want to be. You're going to be going on vacation. You're going to be taking days off. You're going to get sick. So you have to make sure that the documentation is written properly such that if the most junior DBA is there on schedule and he's on his, his sh shift, he can take that documentation, read through it, and follow the instructions according to how you've written it. Is it readily available? Gone are the days when each server will have its own logbook placed on top and that everybody looking at servicing the hardware or the server can look at the logbook because now everything's going digital. I'm all for going digital because I hate printing stuff. I want to save more trees. However, Say, for example, your document is in a central do a document repository like SharePoint. What if your SharePoint system goes down? How can you access that system? You have to make sure that the documentation is readily available in case your digital storage also went down with your main system. Next, you have backups. And I mentioned earlier it's not just about backups. It's making sure that your backups have been tested. You answer the question, where are they stored? Most companies will back up the disk and then there's a central backup system that will take all those backups, whether it's a database backup, a system backup, an application backup, into a centralized backup uh, server and then stored to tape. The question is, is, as a DBA or as an IT professional, do you know 
where they are stored. If you have a backup strategy in place and a retention policy in place that takes the backups and stores them on disk and retains them for X amount of days and then copies off to, to tape, you know that you can find backups on your local drives or on, on the SAN, unless of course somebody mistakenly deleted those uh, assuming that they're on, on tape. But if you don't know where the, those backups are stored, how can you even restore them? Do you have access? Again, if you have a backup policy in place where the backups get stored on tape and the tapes get sent to an off, off site or a remote location, do you know the lion who's responsible for keeping those tapes? And if you do know that person, is he authorized to release those tapes? Once you have backups, do you have permissions and privileges on the server to restore those backups? Again, do you have access? And are they properly labeled? The reason why the database maintenance plan in SQL Server, when you create a backup strategy using the database maintenance plan, the reason the naming convention includes the year, the day, the month, the hour, the minute, and, and that sort of fashion, the reason why it's there is because, number one, we're humans, we make mistakes, and we need to make sure that we've identified the right backup to restore. Because the last thing you want is trying to restore a backup that took five hours to restore and happened to be the wrong backup. Make sure that they're properly labeled, not just on the file when you generate the backup files, but on tape. Like I said, the worst thing that could ever happen is assuming that you have the right tape, restore the tape or the backup on tape without realizing that it was the wrong backup. Installation media is also important. Not just the installation media for SQL Server or Windows, but firmwares and drivers as well. If you have a, a busted server, for example, you don't have a DR site, or maybe you, you, you don't want to redirect everybody on a DR site, but you want to rebuild the system as quickly and as you possibly can. You have the run book, you have everything, but you don't have the firmware or the driver. Your application might not be able to connect to the, the database because you don't have the right firmwares or drivers. Make sure you have installation media for those. And finally, in case you haven't figured it out, you. You, your brain, your, your, your knowledge, your, the information you have in you. You are a storage. Share your knowledge. I like to share my, my knowledge through presentations on user groups, to courses like this. There's a lot of opportunities that you can do this internally via knowledge transfer, mentoring sessions, shadow sessions. You're learning these concepts through this course. Think about how you can share that information to a junior DBA or a junior staff. Like I said, you're not going to be there 24-7. You don't want to be there 24-7. So you need to make sure that if you're not around, a more junior DBA will be able to do what you can do. Make sure that you're willing to share that information.